we live in paradise. This is an absolutely gorgeous island. And we do have a very warm culture. People can be very warm and welcoming. Um, if a tourist comes and basically stays within the confines of the tourist environment, um, they will leave, I think, with a favorable impression. But if you go into the towns, um, if you spend any time at all, you begin to see the fringes of the issues, those that are homeless, those that um, are having major mental health issues and other kinds of issues. Um, and then if you actually start to live here, then you really begin to see that, yes, we are in paradise, but paradise is missing many of the basic elements that make living here um, easy and pleasurable. We are somewhat abhorred when we see people on the streets, living in the bush, upset when they throw rocks at, at uh, subway windows or, or McDonald's windows, or when they come up and ask people on the street for, can you give me a dollar, can you give me a dollar, can you give me a dollar? These are the results of not addressing the problem, trying to be in, I think, what I call denial. The community's been in denial so long that some of these people become invisible. What happens is that you've got people on the streets and they can be just nuisance, just getting in your face asking for money or breaking a, a windshield, or they may commit serious crimes. And I'm not here implying that because they're mentally ill they commit serious crimes, but they do sometimes. And what happens is that they end up in prison. Now, the most common pattern recently is that since our, for instance, hospital on St. Croix does not have a psychiatric facility, we still have a lot of people that commit crimes and, and these crimes land them in prison. I refer to the mentally ill inmates uh, as the hospitalization for the prison because that's the only place that they can get the care at this time. I've seen uh, an increase in the number of mentally ill inmates at the prison since the Wanlui psych unit has been closed. I work in Golden Grove facility, the adult correctional facility, and I can tell you right now we've got 30 something mentally ill people in there. And not all of them are there as forensic patients. They're there because they were picked up off the streets for committing one crime or another, and they, are, they have histories of mental illness. And they were in treatment, some of them, or some of them should have been in treatment. Good afternoon. It's, it's something very great. Like, for instance, the older people always be that way good morning, good afternoon. And I find that uh, the way how the worlds go, it make me, it give me the great pleasure to keep being more and more and more stronger with myself, greeting people, because that way, it'll make things better for all of us in the world. The first time that I knew that I had an illness was when after I attacked my sister and my brother in law I, I, I had a, fight with them because I thought that they were trying to kill me and I was defending myself. They sent me to the hospital and that's when they, they told me that I had a bipolar disorder schizoaffect. I didn't understand what it meant and they couldn't get me on the right medication. They used to test, test me on different medications and I still wasn't getting better. So I left the island and I went to the States and that's when I got on the correct medication because when I go and I complain about whatever I'm going through, the doctor tells me, oh, go to, New go to the States so, or go wherever you cost them to go to get medication. First of all, when I, my grandmother died around 1984, first time in my life I got severely depressed. So depressed that I lost about maybe 60 pounds. I was depressed, sad mad it longer than a month. That's one of the definitions. If you're sad longer than a month, that's one of the definitions of and lose lots of weight. Um, the 
the depression sort of was a low-grade depression since then. And both my daughter, who was a doctor, and my present psychiatrist said I was probably bipolar back then, but it was masked by depression. And about the stress increased 80 years ago. 80 years ago, um, problems with my marriage, problems on the job, and I was having problems with my son. He um, he's going through his own his own changes. And uh, I won't go into detail with him, but I would say when I decided to retire and I didn't understand whether or not how much money I had in the system, next thing I know, I wouldn't get in any money for like six months. So I asked my family to let me have the shares from, which end up being 150000 and my daughter got extremely angry for them doing that. She said she had been declared, you know, incompetent. When I was a young teenager coming up, I used to like to, you know, sports off. I was a good athlete, very handsome, very sharp. I used to always have the, the latest. And I had a lot of girlfriends. And I had two girlfriends that I had a more love for more than the rest of them at the time and these two girlfriends it was just something special about them i had one in my hometown where i live and you wouldn't believe you're gonna laugh about this i used to actually walk from i used to make love to the one in grove walk from grove place to Camperico and make love to the other girl in Camperico and still come back from Camperico walking back to grove them time I was in good health, but I mean I still in good health. But then, as I grow older and go to junior high and start to move on to the the higher school, they get more serious with me, saying that I have to make a decision which one I'm gonna really stick with. I decide I'm giving none of them up. Well, the both of them give me the done. I take it on very strongly and I try to kill suicide, kill myself. And then my sister was going through some problem too with her boyfriend. Her boyfriend used to beat up because she wasn't had all that education. And he and my father used to go through a lot of ups and downs. So my father tell him if you love her, you'll treat her right. If you don't love her, let her go. And he take a knife and stab my father fifteen times. So all of that, even though my girlfriend and plus my father, I take it on and for ever since that time, I was on medication from since now to net to then. Ruben was always, he was always different than the rest. In school, he was always an a student. From the time he was like seven, eight years old, he liked flowers. And that's what got him through college because it never left him. And, and he wanted to go to college, he wanted to study that. And so he ended up with a, a degree in agriculture um, at Florida a and He came home and spent two weeks, real confused. And, and when he came home, all he wanted to do is, the only thing that was important to him was cannabis. Because when he was in college, I used to talk to the, the whether she was a nurse or whatever, that was the counselor or whatever was dealing with him in reference to his issues, you know, and she would tell me plain out, she said, if, if Ruben would stick on his medication and stop smoking, eventually he'll be able to wean off the medication because his situation is not that dire. As far as, I guess, what the doctor diagnosed or how they diagnose him. But um, he couldn't stop. Estamos casado oficialmente 14 años más tres o cuatro años conviviendo, pero el challenge vino en el 2005. Yo estaba notando un comportamiento extraño, no común en ella. Ella era una persona muy activa, le decían Spiri, haciendo arreglos florales. Eso no paraba de trabajar, muy activa. De la noche a la mañana fue un cambio de 180 grados. Me acuerdo yo que esa noche no pude casi dormir pensando qué iba a hacer. Porque no es fácil 
tú llevar una persona con una condición mental a una institución médica, si la persona no firma o está de acuerdo para su tratamiento, tienes que ir a un juez y es, y es cuesta arriba cuando tú sabes que se necesita. Eso fue en octubre del 2000, 2005. Yo cojo, yo estoy en la casa, estoy nerviosa, estoy en un pánico, tengo una ansiedad tremenda, yo jalo mi maleta, cojo y pongo todo en mi maleta, llamo a mi hija y le digo, mira mi, mi hija, me pasa esto, estoy, estoy nerviosa, necesito salir de, de aquí, sé que tengo que salir de Santa Cruz, no puedo estar aquí. Me calmó ella un poco, saco la ropa de nuevo de la maleta para guardarla y luego la pongo de nuevo. Y yo digo, ¿pero qué rayo es que me pasa? Yo no sé qué me pasa. Cuando él, él llega a la casa, abre la puerta, me encuentra con un machete en la mano. Tuve seis meses aceptando la condición mía. No me dejé caer. Mucha gente contaba que era un ataque de corazón y de, comprendieron, ok, yo contaba que un corazón, no, 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 nada me pasa el corazón, yo estoy bien, Dios gracias. Una me dice, ay, yo contaba que era una brujería que te hicieron, muchacha. Y yo, no, 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 no hay brujo que nada. Es una condición que yo tengo, que tengo que bregar por el resto de mi vida con... So, yo a caballito me monto y sigo con mi medicina mientras no pueda conseguir porque es tan costosa. When I first got sick, that's what my mom used to say. That I was, that somebody get over on me and that's why I was sick. We come from a very religious background. And then after, first it was over and then they said I had demons and that they had to be casted away from me. I went to enough of those um, spiritual um, castings that they did and Nothing was making me feel any better. I feel that like more people need to be aware of mental illness and be educated about mental illness because then they will know what to do in churches, in the, Christ the Christian sector, more than anything. Because I knew of a girl that she killed her two children and she was going to church and The church was helping her, housing her and everything, but they weren't getting her the medication because they were telling her it was a bad spirit. And and it's the same thing with me when I when when I get sick, I speak in tongues, like if I'm in church, I, I preach, I become persons from the Bible because I become I come from a Christian background. And they confuse all of that with Christianity. Instead of thinking, oh, she's mentally ill, they just think, oh, it's, oh, it's, it's the church who needs to cast out the demons because she's full of demons. In, in any spiritual tradition, there is the spirit. And the belief among many people is that mental illness is an illness of the spirit, that somehow you've done something wrong and you're being punished or you know you've been taken over I mean somehow you are possessed and the, so the stigma actually comes from as I say centuries ago of this possession this belief that this evil spirit has possessed you and now you are not the person that you were and if somehow we can um, extricate the spirit and we can get rid of that negative evil influence, then you'll once again become the person that you were before you were um, possessed. I think what's important is to separate out the beliefs about mental illness and how it's caused from the practices of religions. When they call you crazy, how does that make you feel? It, it makes me feel bad. I'm embarrassed. Um, I'm embarrassed by it because it's it's not something that I can control myself. When the condition has come, um, it's nothing that I can do. It's, it's if they had me on the right medication, I won't I won't have relapsed. So, but it's. It's, it's very sad. I, I see a lot of people when when they're out of their medication, and I can tell. And
and they are walking the streets and I see them and I, and I hear the comments that people make about them and, and it's hurtful. I think it's important to understand what happens when a person develops a major mental illness. It is a very difficult process because it is emotionally taxing, not only on the person themselves, but on the people around them. It is a great case for burnout for family members and the extended network of people that begin with great enthusiasm to want to help, to want to be a part of the, the, the solution rather than becoming a part of the problem. What happens is if there is not an adequate network of professional care supporting those persons, if there isn't respite care for those persons, eventually they burn out. And it could be easy to say, well, don't you love this person and so on. But truth be told, when a person is severely mentally ill, they are dangerous if they are not treated. Not all, by any means. But we all have the stories. We've all had the experiences. When you see a lot of people on the streets, what you're looking at is the end product of a lack of support to families and a lack of structure within a system to support those persons. I'm looking back over my tracks. This is what I see, black people in slavery. The bark of the dog, the crack of the whip. You better run, black boy, if massa catch you with licks. So we are marching for freedom to die for this homeland. Either death or victory for me. Congress passed a law in 1940 that allowed for the U.S. Virgin Islands to have their committees admitted to Saneys. It's my understanding, although we haven't been able to verify many of these facts, is that there was no uh, facility in the Virgin Islands that was qualified to take care of people for a longer period of inpatient hospitalization. Congress, again, made it possible for Virgin Islands because we were, uh, we had just uh, relieved uh, from under the guidance or, or the servitude of the United States Navy. And so they figured, well, we will take these people that are mentally ill from our, this U.S. territory. And what's interesting about that is that people were already severely ill. Whether that illness was a bona fide psychiatric illness or a neurological illness or even mental retardation, as they called it in those days, um, it didn't make any difference. These people were put on a a boat from here, they would land in New York and then be put on a bus and transported down to Washington, D.C., none of which was familiar to them. So this major disorientation had begun from the time they got on the first boat because a lot of these people had not even been in a car. We found census data that says in 1941 there were 44 individuals from the U.S. Virgin Islands cared for here at St. Elizabeth's. From 1941 until 1987, when the last Virgin Islander was admitted here under that law, uh, there's approximately 250 to 300 individuals were cared for here. By the time I saw the records, I was able to scrutinize the medical records of some of these people. I noticed a couple things that happened. One of the things was that some of the patients had lobotomies, and I'm not sure that permission was given for those lobotomies. The second thing was that um, a lot of the, these people died. Some of them died. And they ended up in graves that are still, I think, around St. Elizabeth's Hospital. I can tell you uh, we have two individuals that I have very good records on. One of them stayed here for 28 years. The other one stayed here for 31 years. That is far longer than a length of stay that would otherwise um, have occurred if the person was, for instance, from the District of Columbia. The costs to the Virgin Islands government were initially, I, I guess, zero. There was always a cost to the patients <clears throat> because they were separate from their, separated from their families and their culture. And we ended up owing millions of dollars. The worst 
part about residential care is that you have in effect taken the patient and separated them from their community, from what is familiar to them. So they cannot participate in the therapy, in the counseling, in the treatment. And so if that person is away for a year or more, they've kind of lost touch with what is familiar. Those charges became prohibitive. And what happened is that we tried to respond to it by trying to build facilities in the Virgin Islands. Uh, none was built on St. Croix. In St. Thomas, there was uh, the Michelle Motel. Michelle Motel on St. Thomas was being used by the government of the Virgin Islands as a long-term care facility. It was deplorable conditions. I mean, there were, ma there were mattresses on the floor. Um, heck, staff was, was almost nil. There, was, there were just people there to maintain the residents to be sure they stayed within the facility. There was a total lack of mental health care services. And then they built, maybe 10 years ago, the Elger Shelterburn facility which was something that we could have transitioned people from places like St. Elizabeth. In the meantime, of course, we still had people that needed long-term care. And what the Virgin Islands government was forced to do, beginning, I believe, in the 90s, was to send these people that needed long-term care off island. Because the Virgin Islands did not have a facility to hold people uh, criminally convicted as not guilty by reason of insanity. And so they were there at, at Michelle Motel too, but they would say they were the less violent ones. To the tune that between the education, health, and human services, I believe, I can't say that I'm sure, but I believe that we spend somewhere between 15 and maybe 20 mid-twenties in millions of dollars a year f to take care of those folk that are from the Virgin Islands that need long-term care. The Virgin Islands had a very small population in the 50s and 60s. With the, as I mentioned, passage of the Community Mental Health Systems Act in the mid-60s, the Virgin Islands received funding like every other state and territory to build community mental health clinics. And therefore, there was an increase in mental health services during the 70s, where, as I understand it, they had psychiatrists on board, they had psychologists, they had a, even an outreach team. They had a public health um, psychiatric nurse who were all part of the mental health services system under the Department of Health, and they created the Division of Mental Health. What you're describing is the birth of the public health and community mental health system. And I will give full credit to Dr. Chester Coatman, who is another native son, came back from training in the States and was completely committed to creating a community mental health system here in the territory. He was then the commissioner of health and in his tenure, he took community-based people, he trained them, and he located them just as, as you've described in each of the communities. Basically, what was happening is that we were able to take the services to the people. Because the truth of the matter is the way that mental health care is structured, the structure is a barrier to care. You want to have the mental health care provided as close to the individual as possible in the school, in the home, in the community. Not that they have to get, you know, and go some far away place. It's hard for me to talk about how it started failing because, you know, much of the start of the failing took place after I left. But my, my focus was to teach people behavioral skills. First of all, they were easier to teach. Uh, and it was easier to take a population of folks who may not have been classically trained in uh, various mental health 
uh, disciplines and teach them good functional skills to interact with clients and to change clients' behavior. It used to be that the Division of Mental Health had personnel who worked in the hospital. We had nurse, nurses that worked inside the psychiatric unit. They belonged to, to health, not the hospital. And so there was a good flow back and forth on what was going on in the hospital and what was going on in the community. Well, that, that, that was phased out. But we still had workers that would go up to the hospital. About that, that was one of the things that I used to do. I used to go to the hospital maybe twice a week, go up on the unit, see who's up there. Uh, if I didn't put them up there, or had them put up there myself, I would go and check on who I had sent up there or who was up there, and we would work out a plan while they're in the hospital for them to come back into the community, work with their families, get everything all set up. And then in the 70s also, we had the Community Mental Health Act, which brought a lot of monies into outpatient programs. We developed, there were like 13 or more different programs under the Community Mental Health Act. Services for children, services for inmates or detained people, for the elderly. Human Services Department ran very well because they kept their leaders in place even when there was a political change. <laughs> With the health department, that didn't happen. When the, when, the when the politics, when a new political person came in, he brought in his new, a new people, and their priorities were, may not have been what the old set of priorities were. You needed somebody in place over the long run so that you would have a, a smooth transition from political change to political change. And in the late 70s, I, I was the one psychiatrist here. I would go to St. Thomas and St. John. We'd, go, we'd make home visits on St. Croix, St. Thomas, and St. John. The team would go there. And then when all these people came in, uh, Dr. Maxwell Jones came to St. Croix. He was the founder of uh, the community, the, the uh, therapeutic community. And he had recruited a large number of people from the mainland. Uh, who were predominantly white uh, to uh, come and uh, implement the Community Mental Health Center's grant. Uh, it was a lot, lots of federal money. Um, that grant had a requirement for uh, a, a local matching Fun. Unfortunately, a few things happened in the Virgin Islands that undermined the continuation of that movement. Um, a major issue that occurred in the mid-80s was the change as a savings measure in the way that mental health services were funded on the federal level. When I came in 1987, mental health was getting a federal block grant of two and a half million dollars every year. Instead of having a block grant to the territories, they said we're going to treat the territories the same as the states and we're going to a per capita. So instead of having the money available, whether we had 100,000 or, or a million people, it was based on the amount of people in your population. And so we went from two and a half million down to about a little under 300,000. And of course, it's been cut back ever since. The government never really matched that grant with cash. So it was always a, a situation where the government did some kind of finagling of in-kind services. The problem with, the, uh, with that was that the Community Mental Health Center's grant was a grant of decreasing dollars. It was a long-term grant. But each year, when you renewed your plans, uh, you submitted your, uh, your report, 
uh, and renewed your plans, the federal amount would decline and the local amount was supposed to increase in the amount of the federal declination. And that never really happened. That was really the built-in demise of the mental health system. So you can imagine that all of the services that were out in the community had to be consolidated back into the two centers that I've talked about at, um, up at Charles Harwood and down at Frederickstead Health Center. And the same thing happened in St. Thomas. And uh, today, it, I mean, you wouldn't recognize it today based on what it was when I first came here. And a lot of people were trying to get into mental health, the professionals were trying to get into mental health in those days. Today, they hardly have a, a staff to go around to do the work that they needed. Uh, when I go down to Frederickstead, there's only one worker down there. And then the doctor comes in and a nurse comes in and once or twice a week. But the, but the people that, do, that are involved in the groundwork, there's hardly anybody there to, to do it on a, on a daily basis. Christian State Clinic is a little better up in Charles Howard, but, uh, but it's far below where it used to be. Right now we don't have enough counselors outpatient. We don't have enough staff inpatient. We don't even have a, a, a facility inpatient here. Um, we don't have the kinds of programs that we had, the outreach programs, the community programs, the, the special services, but we don't have any of these anymore. So we're just now running at bare bones, skeletal um, profile of, of services that we're providing to people on this island. Uh, I tip my hat off to those people in mental health who still find it possible to provide counseling services to the people in these islands. Because the fewer counseling services you have, the more medication you got to use. And I would love for us to have a, a million counselors so I don't have to give any medications. The short end of the stick were the persons with mental illness getting flow of dollars to maintain the services that were in place. And so they totally got left out of the picture over a number of administrations and a lot of the services that were in place disappeared. A lot of the people and continuity and the systems in place disappeared. So that's why we got to the time around 1999, 2000, you get the intact report, which basically reflected the demise of what was in place and given some recommendations of what you need to do to revamp, rejuvenate, and get a functioning mental health care system in place in the Virgin Islands. The police, of course, were somewhat a recipient of the lack of mental health services being in place because they were the ones picking up people. Matter of fact, I think the police department had to hire a psychiatrist. I have a paper that if it states that if I fell back into this situation of losing my consciousness, I have to be hospitalized. There's no hospital here for, for me. I would have to either go to Puerto Rico or Florida to be hospitalized. Medication are costly. Our people that does not have a, the, the meds are the same people that are walking the streets. Why? Because no one gives a damn or care about what's going on here. They have, they, have pair, they have families, and the families say, oh, she's crazy, and that's it. No, she's not crazy. She has a condition. As we know, our governor's son is a hyperactive. He has a condition. He has parents. His parents work. They have money. They could, they could afford to help their son. What happened to a person that doesn't have income? We need our health patients, our dis disabled Patients equal. I think in most part, people that is in control or running mental health, I think there's a disconnection in, in reference to our understanding and any deep concern. And, and you know, the old people that say, if you don't feel it, you don't know it. And I, I think the, because of the ignorance, 
they don't understand the depth in which it have an effect, you know, and the family and the society and as a whole. I watch my son's situation and medication and half, and I, I see where he could be an asset instead of a, a liability to society. But for some reason, the system seems to be failing him in reference to getting him to that level. My family member's condition is schizophrenia. My brother's name is Kenroy Watson. My child's name is Andrea. He has been diagnosed as a schizophrenic catatonic. She was diagnosed with schizophrenia. My son has PTSD. My daughter's condition is postpartum depression. I am a parent of two adult children, both diagnosed with mental illness. He was in the Iraq war. My struggle. My struggles. The struggle with my son is that he's bipolar. Taking her medication. The lack of the medical expertise on the island. She was misdiagnosed. The understanding how to access the different types of services that are available in the territory, um, in addition to the financial services, that's an extreme struggle for us. I went to Social Security, I was denied twice already. I went to Lutheran Services for housing for him. They said he's not housing material. My struggle is trying to get a place for my son. When your child has a problem. Where does he come when no one else is going to take care of him? He's going to come home. So even right now, my son has to live in the States because there's more services for him there. But the problem there is, is that I'm not there to advocate for him. My greatest problem is she is my only child. So who is going to come and assist her? Who is going to be there? So I must say with a mental health system that is very lacking, that those individuals who are living in residential or support programs off island need to find a place to come back here. We need to build our system. We need to do so not only with government, but also with the support of nonprofits and families. So I must say after 13 years of being away and living and, and being in remission and finding the medications that work, she is stable. And I must say thanks to the support of family as well as friends. But we need to turn and look at our system, our government system and our system here at home to be, be able to provide those services to all our, our clients. My first meeting with Je uh, Jeff Nelson was an eye-opener for me in that Jeff Nelson indicated that psychiatry was a lost leader and it was one of the places that they really had to look at in terms of trying to stabilize uh, the financial well-being of the hospital. We need to make sure that we have the best care, the best care in all areas that we have, and this is one of those areas that we've decided to move on. We're moving those patients as we speak. Uh, some of those patients are being discharged to their home, but the patients that are not are gonna be moved to uh, Fort Lauderdale. We're not doing anything that different that the community has already experienced, at least on St. Thomas, but it's a process that is secure the patients, make sure they're stabilized, make sure we're giving them the right care, and then move them to the right place. And that is either to their home or to other locations. By closing down the psych unit, we have been displaced. There is no place for us to go. You go to the hospital, they try to send you back home. They don't want, they, they don't have any place to keep you when you want and need services. If tomorrow I have to go in, for help, I know it's not gonna be there. Because it shut down, it put people back in the streets. It, 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 it's, it's hard to know that you have an island that has no hospital, because that's a shell. The psych unit immediately, being shut, immediately created a backflow. Patients couldn't get past the emergency room. Those were there, and then they tried this notion of sending people to St. Thomas, which had significant implications for a lot of reasons, but most significant to me was this whole issue of confidentiality. You see somebody walking with a nurse going on a seaplane and acting a little strange, 
that's an outing that should never have happened. The other thing is that since people can't get on the unit, uh, the St. Thomas thing was rough on staff, it was rough on the patients, it was rough on the family, and it was rough on the St. Thomian staff also because they then had the extra burden of dealing with extra patients. The driving engine in America behind the healthcare system is the insurance industry. How dollars are spent, be they HMOs or be they um, you know, rehabilitation centers, what drives the doctors, what drives the system, unfortunately, is the dollar. And unfortunately, that leaves a lot of people out from under that umbrella of care because it doesn't generate money. Why do we have a dialysis unit here in the Virgin Islands? It wasn't any when I first got here, but because Medicare or Medicaid pays for it, now you have independent dialysis units. So therefore, what, what is more apparent than what drives what services are available than the dollar? You'll see now laser units or doctors coming down and doing eye care because it can be paid by insurance. What better place to live than doing laser surgery and you know collecting dollars? Psychiatry never made money because you, if you stop and think about it, these are the people that were least likely to have jobs and maintain health insurance and so on, you know, because of the nature of their illnesses. I found myself leaving that institution uh, shortly after Jeff Nelson came. And then when the word was that came out that the psych unit was in fact shuttered, in no way should we just drop some negative aspersions on the staff of that psychiatric facility because there had been issues that had to do with administrative issues, with management issues, with financial issues, and the whole gamut. So let us not just point our fingers specifically on the psych unit. I think at the time when it happened in St. Croix, you, they took advantage of a lack of uh, a psychiatrist and lack of staff in place who would advocate and fight to maintain that unit. So somewhat it was a matter of timing. Those people who had been the heroes before maintaining that unit were no longer there to protect it and protect the rights of those persons with disabilities. And the community, even though they stepped up and tried to intervene to stop it from being shut down, part of it was they were ignored by the hospital board, as far as I can tell, and did not see the long-term consequences of shutting down the unit, and basically bought into a, um, a basically a misinformational campaign as to what was really going on and why they needed the uh, revamping of that unit. It was adequate as it was. It had survived and had been providing services, except that now someone came in with a new vision and decided, well, he's trying to build up a new hospital, well, not a new hospital, but build up costs and profit centers. And who easier to pick on than, than persons with mental illness? The decision to close a unit um, was made by, by my predecessor. Um, because at the time, um, there were a couple of inc incidences where quality of care was, was affected. And so um, the cen Center of Medicare and Medicaid Services had actually um, known about it, and um, they wanted us to, to address it and to address it immediately. We ne needed to fix this problem. The solution would have been to um, start over again to either train your staff that was presently there or to remove those staff and to be and to put some new staff in however um, the decision was made to take that as an opportunity to revamp the the entire unit once the decision was made to close that unit we could not re reopen it it shut down and it created some serious repercussions because if we remember correctly, the word was that we're shutting it down to do repairs and we're going to reopen. And then after about a year or eight months, you heard that, oh, we can't reopen because to reopen it's going to cost over a million dollars. Whereas when we shut it down, it would have cost maybe $100,000 to refurbish it, get it back up to, to caliber, and then 
go, go back in. In the meantime, other things started happening. And remember, this hospital never got over its dialysis issues. And so that was why CMS had a permanent presence there in the hospital because of dialysis. CMS pretty much told us um, you can't reopen it until we know that you can provide quality of care to the rest of the hospital. So you focus first on fixing all the deficiencies in the entire hospital, and then um, we will determine whether you can reopen up that unit. And one of the things that happened, more arrests. Young people in their teens arrested, taken to prison for going into a store and walking out with something, but inappropriate, and you could see that they're hearing voices or just not being real. Uh, older people. And, and so this whole thing now has created, instead of inpatient at Governor Juan F. Louis Hospital, they're now inpatients at, in the jail. And, and that, in my opinion, is inhumane. As far as the hospital not having a psych unit, that's a big, that's a big blow for us. Because for acute patients, when we have patients that have acute um, episodes, we transport them to the emergency room and they're stabilized or housed in the, they used to be housed in the, at least for 30 days on the psych unit. That would allow them to have access to other mental health workers that have the resources that we don't have. But now with the closing of the psych unit, that's not a possibility. They, what we do is we, we do send them to the emergency room, but all they do is stabilize them and send them right back here. It's a disservice to them and it's a disservice to us. We have the added burden of not being able to uh, pay for the services that, that the hospital is, is providing to us. So not being able to pay for the services, we're not, we can't make any demands on the, on the hospital for as far as you know, what kind of services our patients should receive because we don't have the support of leadership as far as government leadership. Because I don't think it is recognized in the Virgin Islands that you don't just house um, mentally ill patients in a, in a jail. Just, you don't take somebody who is suffering from cardiac um, disease or diabetes or any other illness and you know, just put them in jail. Mental illness is a disease just like any other disease. It's an illness. One of the things that you are going to be shocked at, when I say you, I mean somebody who doesn't work either in the prison or in the hospital. But at Golden Grove, I've got more psychiatric patients than the hospital, the two hospitals combined. What does that tell you? That tells you what has been done with patients who need to be in a hospital or need to be in mental health system. They are arrested, they're thrown in there. And the reason is that they're off the street, out of sight, out of mind, number one. Number two, their families are as as bad as it is, their families sometimes say, well, thank God he's not going to kill me. Because that's what happens a lot. Of, they're beaten up on their own families. Number three, they are there because they committed a crime that may be serious. It may be just a nuisance crime, but they've been doing it every day. They go into businesses, and they would urinate, or they would just walk in and take place, or threaten patient, customers. This has been happening. And it happens all over. But guess what? They end up in our system, and I've had mentally ill people who came into the prison, never had a trial for three years, and have been in there. And is, whose fault is that? Well, guess what? Sometimes the families say, Doc, I went and I saw them, and they looked much better than when they were there. At least I know, and this is hard, at least I know they're in a safe place where I don't have to wonder if they got killed last night because we've had that also. There was one year when we had three or four mentally ill patients killed on St. Croix. Before we can even get them to any secure facility, we have to do an assessment and we do that with a hospital. We notify the hospital that we have a person who is acting out, uh, their exchange behavior, we don't know if this individual is on drugs or if he hasn't taken his medication, but once we then go to the hospital to get an assessment. 
it is at that point where that assessment is do then done where we make the necessary arrangements if that person is going to be incarcerated at one of the local pr at the prison then we go ahead and we do that uh, the type of crime that the individual might have been involved in in some instances might be a simple shoplifting case unfortunately well we don't use the word shoplifting but a person going into a retail establishment taking items without paying for them we're called in and we do try to find out what's going on with that sometimes the persons that we deal with in those instances um, in addition to having mental disabilities they also have some substance abuse problems as well epidemiological studies worldwide suggest that within the worldwide population four to six percent of the worldwide population have what we call major mental illness, schizophrenia, bipolar, major depression with schizophrenic symptoms. That prevalence rate occurs in India, in um, Tiberia, in um, Ni Nigeria, and in the U.S. Virgin Islands. But the major ones, I think, that we have the problem with in the Caribbean and the Virgin Islands are those that are induced by substances, we have, we have such a huge substance abuse problem. So then you're going to be looking at addictions. You're going to be looking at mood disorders, depressions, but it is associated with alcoholism, with drug addiction. Um, and you're going to be looking at violence of all kinds. You're going to be looking at domestic violence. You're going to be looking at violence perpetuated in the community. You see the rise in criminal activity that is consonant equal to the rise in substance use. So there are a number of factors and cross currents that occurred which contributed to the demise of the mental health system and focusing on trying to revive it and get the continuity of care is essentially why we brought the lawsuit to get all the parties on the table. First of all, get them out of denial and say yes, we don't have a functioning mental health system, let's put one in place. And that's what occurred in 2009 when we finally got the consent judgment, a settlement agreement with the government of Virgin Islands to start working on a strategic plan to put a functioning mental health care system back in place in the Virgin Islands. With the class action, they brought out to light the things that we need. We need a psychologist. We don't have a psychologist. We need... Um, we need a, another psychi psychiatrist. We only have one psychiatrist. She only works two days, two days in Fredericksted and two days or three days in Christianster. And we need somebody full time at the Fredericksted clinic and somebody full time at the Christianster clinic. Yo necesito un psiquiatra. Necesito medicamento. Necesito yo y mi gente. Necesitamos un psiquiatra que filme en Santa Cruz. Sé que hay mucho más de 300 gente que necesita atención. Y no va para el hospital porque ya cerraron el sitio. Necesito el sitio abierto de lo nuevo porque necesitamos sacar a nuestra gente fuera de la calle que coge en peligro y va a un carro y le da. Necesito de todos los senadores y gobernadores que por favor pasen el número 722 y el 723 y es nosotros somos el gobierno. And I think that's what we're trying to address in the lawsuit as well is that the community has to maintain involvement about the type of care and what they want for care because who is the government but the people? The people must step up and speak out for what they want. In order to get what you need for your society, you need to be a part of the process. We are closely monitoring um, the development of a comprehensive health care plan for the territory. And I think all of us who have worked in this area, we know what needs to be done and the the thing is going to be of course the funding because it's not going to be cheap we have allowed mental health services to go by the wayside for a number of years 
It's not going to be cheap, but I do not think we can avoid the issue any longer. I think the only thing that we can resolve and I want us to resolve is to resolve the misinformation, the stigmatization, the, um, you know, the, the discrimination that is visited on people with mental illness. I want a person to be as comfortable to say, well, you know what? I really have to go take my antidepressants because, you know, I'm having such um, a reaction to the lack of sun and that really forces me into a depression. So, excuse me, let me go do that. I would like people to be as comfortable for coming for mental health checkups once a year as they are for coming for physical checkups. And I want people to understand that mental illness is an illness, just like any other illness. Probably 100, 200 years from now, we will see the, the neurosynaptic problems in our brain that are contributing to mental illness. We're getting much and much, we're getting closer and closer. That's why medications are work and they're, and they're more and more refined. It's so important, and I'm not focusing on medication. What I'm focusing on that I want people to feel comfortable in recognizing that they're not feeling right and they need to go and talk with someone, talk to someone who can help. Education, education, education. And again, you know, it goes right back to medication compliance. And I think that that's the biggest challenge is to get a person who is mentally ill to understand that if you take your medication every day, no fail, that this, you're feeling good now, this good feeling will always be there. I see the problem around me. It's happening where, the way I live, and it happened in Alta Kimak. It happened all over the world. You see what's going on. These killings and things is because sickness. Nobody like to be sick. But once you get the help, take the help. But it's not easy. Look around us. It's a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of people out there need help. And uh, they belong to mental health. But I don't know what's the problem, but we have a big problem. And like I say, we need to walk fast. Because mental illness is a very serious very serious sickness. I'm looking back over my tracks. This is what I see. Black people in slavery. The bark of the dog. The crack of the whip. You better run, black boy, and master catch you with lips. So we are marching for freedom to die for this homeland. Either death or victory for me.